history, we have the introduction, uh, or my footnote says, uh, Feasts of the Lord. And I have nice little uh, section heads. Um, and it, uh, But to the uh, beginning of the uh, chapter are instructions that God gave to Moses, uh, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. So unlike all the nations of the world that have ever existed, the nation of Israel stood unique in that their holy days, their feast days, were holidays that God gave them, not just things that they came up over time on their own. And the first thing that was mentioned was the Sabbath, which really wasn't a feast day at all. How were they to observe the, the Sabbath? No work. No work. A day of rest. And of course, we know that how as the centuries rolled on, especially after the Babylonian captivity, uh, there were great discussions about, well, what constituted work? How exactly were they supposed to keep the, what was the proper way that they were supposed to keep the Sabbath? We're not going to get into all that tonight. It's just understand it was time when there was to be no work. And a lot of times uh, through these uh, coming chapters, the expression is, I'm using the New King James, which uh, I have, this is my first time to ever use a New King James, uh, and I have really come to, to really like it. Um, it's, uh, it uses the phrase, no ordinary work. But uh, then we get into the listing of all of the feasts, and I believe there are seven, the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, the Feast of first fruits, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, seven in all. It doesn't get too much into detail as to how these feasts were to be carried out. The detail is coming later on. We, when we get into the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy, we're going to find out just what all the detail inc was included, especially in the animal sacrifices. And uh, in some of the, uh, the feasts, there were a lot of sacrifices, a, a lot of blood, animal blood was shed. But the first one was uh, Passover, and this was to be held on the 14th day of the first month. And of course, uh, we know the story of the first Passover uh, the night before they were released from their bondage in Egypt, where every family was to uh, kill their, their Passover lamb. And here we are uh, at this moment in time, they now have their tabernacle uh, set up and the tabernacle worship has uh, been set up. So the sacrifice for the Passover lamb is going to be done at the temple. But they uh, still, the people still observe the Passover with the unleavened bread and the bitter herbs. And of course, we can, as from our vantage point here in this moment of time where we have the New Testament and the Old Testament in the same book and we can pair both covenants side by side, we, we, real, we can clearly see the symbolism. Uh, well, here we have uh, Jesus is symbolized in the sacrifice. The, uh, the event, of course, was when the destroyer uh, spared the firstborn of the Israelites. And we see God, uh, in, or Jesus, He is going to be our Savior where we will not die. Uh, so here we, we clearly see the, the symbolism of, of Jesus. The next day after Passover begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
In fact, it's a Passover is the beginning of an eight-day period in which there are um, several feasts that are uh, celebrated during the same week. But uh, the second one is um, unleavened bread, and that is begins on the fifteenth day of the first month, and it goes through the twenty-first day of the month. No work was to be performed on the 15th day, and no work was to be performed on the 21st day. And in the observance of this feast, there were burnt offerings and sin offerings. And in a class earlier this month, we went over what all was involved in burnt offerings and sin offerings. So we're not going to go over that again. But in addition to the burnt offerings and sin offerings, there were the the grain offerings of unleavened bread. And um, during this time, only unleavened bread was a type of bread that they could eat. It was a time where all leaven was supposed to be removed from the house. And it was a time of feasting of only unleavened bread. The removal of leaven from the house, do, do you see, let me just ask you a thought question. What do you see uh, in this remove? What is the symbolism here? Purity. Excuse me? Purity. Mm-hmm, Yes. So mm-hmm. it's basically the command. It's just a mm-hmm. faithful. It's just something for obedience. We expected them to do. You know, why would you guess all day? Why he asked that? He said that, but he's God and he can tell us what he wants. Mm-hmm. I totally agree. Any other thoughts? And by the way, uh, I'm wearing my reader, so you all are, are blurry to me. If you have a comment, wave your hand extra high. Wave it a little bit to grab my attention, please. So, In the New Testament, leaven is um, used by Jesus and the Apostle Paul in a negative context. Jesus said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, referring to their, their false doctrine or their false practices, or, but use it, their, their teachings. Paul used it on two occasions, one in his letter to the Galatians, where uh, he was addressing the issue of the, the problem with Judaizing teachers. And here he used the phrase, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. In 1 Corinthians, he uses the same phrase when he's reprimanding them for tolerating this sin in the church where a man had his father's wife. And he was, encouraged, he was telling them they were going to have to deal with this sin in the church. Again, he used the phrase, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It's going to permeate and spread throughout the body. So here, leaven in the context is representing sin. So in my opinion, I, it's just my own opinion, I, I can see leaven as representing, like Dallas mentioned, some impurity or, or sin. And like Keith said, it's, it was just a command. You don't really have to analyze it that deeply. The next was the Feast of First Fruits. And when I first um, read over the Feast of First Fruits, if I had been sitting there uh, as one of the priests receiving the instructions on uh, at on celebrating uh, these feasts, my hand would have been up immediately as like, when did you say we're supposed to observe this? Because it's not exactly obvious, but uh, after reading and rereading, I finally figured out, and with the help of a commentary as well, uh, that it was observed on, uh, it was,
on the first day after Passover during this week of where there is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay, so keep in mind that uh, the Israelites observed a lunar calendar. So Passover could actually occur on any day of the week, but during this eight-day period of celebration, Passover was going to occur sometime during that time. And then the day after Passover was the time that it appears that they celebrated the Feast of, 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 um, of Unleavened, excuse me, Feast of First Fruits. Now, along with this, there was a, um, a lamb, uh, a year old, without spot or blemish, and then there was the unleavened bread, uh, or, yeah, uh, or the grain offering, and a drink offering. The timing of this was uh, a time to remember where they had come from, and where God had brought them up out of the land of Egypt, and they realized it was for them to focus on God being the source of their blessings and them living in the promised land. This was actually a feast that um, they were going to begin when they entered the promised land. They didn't keep this at all during the desert wanderings, but this was something that they began after they entered the promised land. And it was just um, the time of um, where they, uh, it was the, uh, about the time of the first barley harvest. So you had the first reaping of the of the harvest but that first reaping that belonged to the lord so that was the feast of first fruits i can see a little bit of symbolism there where we have um, the first fruits uh, this time of of um, of celebration during the time of of christ with his resurrection it was on the first day of the week after uh, the after the Passover. It would have been actually the resurrection day of Christ, according to uh, that calendar that existed that year. So here we, I can see symbolism where, uh, like we have the first fruit of the harvest. Well. Christ is the first fruit of the resurrection, first fruit of those who are going to rise, never to die again. And this was celebrated with also unleavened bread and a drink offering. The next feast was the Feast of Weeks, which we commonly call Pentecost in the New Testament, and this was seven Sabbaths after the Feast of First Fruits. And it always occurred on the first day of the week, and they counted the first day, well, it was on this, that you take the seventh Sabbath, and then you go to the next day, which would be the first day of the week. And that was when that feast occurred. And it was celebrated with um, a grain offering, a burnt offering, a sin offering, and a peace offering. And it was also, again, a day of no work. Along with the, uh, the listing of the Feast of Weeks here, um, this would have been... The timing was around the time of the wheat harvest, when the, the, uh, the, the big harvest was coming in. And they were given some specific instructions on, instructions on how to, uh, or what to do and what not to do uh, concerning the harvesting of their fields. 
The corners were not supposed to be harvested, and there was no gleaning that was to be done. So the gleaning would have been any type of second sweep to go through the fields to gather up what was missed or to gather up what had been dropped. That was not supposed to be done. The corners and the gleanings were reserved for the poor. This was another way in which the morality that God was setting down for the nation of Israel far surpassed the, the morality of the, of the other nations in the world. I'd like to point out also that um, periodically as we go through all these, uh, these feasts and the uh, imparting of these laws, we have the phrase, I am the Lord. And we talked a little bit last, uh, this past Sunday about that, uh, where here God when he lays out a feast or he lays out a law or something for them to follow, here he is is a means of invoking his full authority as creator of heaven and earth. He's invoking his holiness as well. Okay, the next... Feast was the it will, is the feast of trumpets, and this is farther along in the year. It's the um, commemorated on the first day of the seventh month, seventh month, and this is usually in September according to our our cal- calendar. Uh, the Jews uh, today observe it; they call it Rosh Hashanah, and. Uh, it's sort of a, um, a lead up to the Day of Atonement, but uh, it's a day of no work, and they have their burnt offering, a sin offering, grain offering, and the drink offering as well. That was on the first day of the seventh month, and then on the tenth day of the seventh month, we have the Day of Atonement, a very holy day, no work, and it was a day of fasting. And this was the day of the year where the priest was to go into the most holy place and offer the blood of the sacrificial animals. One, uh, the first time he offered blood for himself, and then the second time he offered, he would sprinkle blood for the people. In addition to that, he, when he first entered the holy place, or the most holy place, he was also supposed to take a censer inside with him with hot coals from the altar and with incense. And he, the first thing he was supposed to do was just to hold the hot coals over the mercy seat and burn the incense and fill up the entire most holy place with the smoke of the incense. And God said, lest you die. So, uh, again, we don't know why it was symbolically symbolized this way, but like Keith said, God commanded it. Of course, in the book of Revelations, we see, uh, we have described the prayers of the saints rising up before the throne of God as incense for him. When he entered the uh, the most holy place, he had the bl- the blood of a bull, and he sprinkled the blood seven times for his own sins. And then the second time he entered, he sprinkled the blood of a kid for the sins of the people seven times. On day fifteen of the seventh month, then we have the feast of tabernacles. And this was a special time of year where they were supposed to remember 
their deliverance and to remember their desert wanderings. And they were to commemorate this. Uh, it was a, uh, a feast that lasted eight days, no work on day one, no work on day number eight. And they were to make for themselves booths or huts, and they were to make them out of tree branches, and they were to it be a recreation of what their ancestors had lived in during the 40 years of wandering. And so this was a physical representation, a physical reminder uh, of what their ancestors lived in, and to just remind them of the years of wandering. This was actually uh, a time of year where the entire, everything that the land was going to produce that year, it was brought, it had been brought in, whether it was grain, vines, whatever. The harvest, the complete harvest was in by this time, and this time uh, was usually um, September or October by our calendar. And by the time this was observed, it was just about time for the fall rainy season to begin, which would normally be the time of planting, so the next uh, fiscal time of, of uh, planting, uh, sowing, and reaping would begin. Well, just we'll come back to that timing. The amount of animal sacrifices that uh, we'll be, be getting into that in the book of Numbers, but there were animal sacrifices to be made on each day of the eight days, and the volume of animals that they were to sacrifice at the altar was just absolutely amazing. So that concludes the, the feast. Uh, and a statement that I find interesting where these are some instructions to them. These are the feasts of the Lord which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering and a grain offering, a sacrifice and drink offerings, everything on its day, besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, besides your gifts, besides all your vows, and besides all your free will offerings which you give to the Lord. We sometimes think that they just gave 10% of what they had to the Lord. No, they gave much more above and beyond if they were faithful to the Lord in, in carrying out their, their practice. Any questions, comments, observations before we move on? Okay, chapter 25. The Sabbath of the seventh year. This is an extension of the concept of the Sabbath day. This applied to the land. For six years they were to sow their fields, reap the harvest. In the seventh year, there was to be no planting, no pruning of the vines. The fields were just to lie fallow. Whatever grew would, would just grow. Now, you probably have heard or will hear, oh yes, this is a sound agricultural practice for the restoration of nitrogen in the soil for the land to renew itself. Yes, I get that. But I think there's a whole lot more going on here. It's uh, the significance of God blessing the seventh day giving the land a Sabbath rest. It's all, all connected in the way I see it. 
So, when they concluded the Feast of Tabernacles, if it was on a if it was time for the Sabbath year, you know, I mentioned a minute ago that it was time for the rainy season to begin. It was about time for them to go out and start plowing their fields and getting ready to sow their grain. That didn't happen that fall. So from about October until October of the following year, there was going to be no planting. Whatever came up or grew, they were not to have a conventional harvest like they would in the other six years. The way it's, it reads, it's like whatever the land produced, it was common property for the landowner, for the aliens that lived with them, uh, for, for anyone, they could eat of the produce of the land. Now, next was the year of Jubilee. So you count seven Sabbath years. You've got 49, you're on the 49th year after seven Sabbath years. And then that's, that Sabbath year is followed up with one more year of rest. So the, the year of Jubilee followed a 50-year cycle. That was kind of like a time of reset where all property reverted and we're talking about real estate it reverted back to the original landowner their concept of real estate is completely was completely different from ours today if we sell a piece of property it's gone we we don't have anything ever to do with that property again not so with the ancient Israelites. If a parcel of land was their inheritance that traced back to when they entered the land and their family, this was a plot that their family inherited by lot, it stayed in their family. So if they sold it in the year of Jubilee, it came back to them. That led to a lot of issues that we're going to get into. Before we get on into some of the um, details of the, um, the year of Jubilee, God clarified to them in this chapter that He would make special provisions for them for the Sabbath year. He addressed the issue, what if you say, what shall we eat in the Sabbath year? Anyone know what the solution was? Mm -hmm. Yes, a bumper crop in the sixth year. So it would last the entire seventh year, which there was no planting. And then in the eighth year, where they had to plant the new crop and wait for it to grow and harvest, it would still last that year too. And then when they started year nine, at the very beginning, they would be finishing up eating that bumper crop from the sixth year. One little caveat, though, they had to remain faithful. This, this was a promise, a blessing that God was going to give them for their faithfulness. I just saw in my notes, I'm about to, I have overlooked at the very end of chapter 24. God addresses the penalty for blasphemy against God and personal injuries. 
Any, the example was uh, an Israelite woman who was married to an Egyptian man. They had a son, obviously an adult son, and he got into a fight with a native Israelite man. And during the fight, this uh, woman's son, who is half Egyptian, half Israelite, he cursed God and blasphemed. It was heard by witnesses, and they wanted to know what was to be done. And the penalty for blasphemy against God for, and for cursing God was death. He was brought outside the camp. The witnesses placed their hands on his head as a, as a sign that they were giving truthful testimony about what they heard, and he was stoned to death by the people. And then God goes on to talk about restitution for personal injury and the killing of someone else's animals. So if you kill someone's animal, you, make, you replace it with like kind. If you personally injure someone, and the phrase that I, that I read in this translation, if you disfigured someone, punishment was to be given in kind. Uh, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. And of course, I have sat in uh, several Bible classes over the year where the teacher, usually uh, one of our previous preachers, says, okay, this is an example where uh, they're illustrating, let the punishment meet the crime. And I'm, I'm not going to say that that's not true. It's just in my own mind, I'm saying, I hope that's the situation. I'm hoping that if someone um, accidentally or maybe even in anger uh, injured someone's eye or a tooth or broke a bone, that they just wouldn't inflict that same penalty. That's the language here. To me, that, it, that doesn't read like figurative language, but I'm hoping that uh, then the practical application that it was let the punishment meet the crime, but in my own mind, it's just a, a big question mark there. Any interpretations that y'all would like to share? Yes? You, you may be referring to the same sermons that I've heard of late, and that was, it was not a, a, a command that an eye be for an eye, but that was the upper limit of the vengeance taken on the offender, that you couldn't take out two eyes because of one eye. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, yes. I, I agree with what you said, too. You know, if somebody loses a finger, you don't take his life. That's not an equal punishment. Mm -hmm. And it didn't have to be a finger for a finger. It might be money. <laughs> it might be, okay, give me so many, so much money, and you know, we're good. Yes. But, uh, it has to suit, I think, both, you know, both parties. But it, there has to be justice for what we want. Yes. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Okay, the year of Jubilee. As I mentioned, it occurs every 50 years at the conclusion of the seventh Sabbath year. The land would remain fallow, and there would be the redemption of property. And God made this statement, For the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. Does that remind you of any New Testament verse? To me, it, remind, it reminded me of um, Ephesians chapter 11, the phrase, uh, the passage referring to Abraham, the other patriarchs, where they confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth, looking for another home. And I thought, wow, here they are, God is telling them they are strangers. I wonder, and I thought, wow, it, 
we have the advantage of seeing two covenants side by side. And we can see the symbolism there. Okay, um, if land had not been redeemed, it would automatically go back to the original owner. There were provisions if a man sold some land and he wanted to redeem that property before the year of Jubilee, there were provisions for him to do so. And it's, uh, you have the principle of proration that's applied, obviously. I, I thought, well, how exactly would this work? And so whenever, obviously, whenever someone would sell some land, it was like a long-term lease in reality. So if they were 10 years away from the next jubilee, well, it would have one value. If they were 40 years away from the next jubilee, it would have another value to it. In fact, the original seller might not even be alive. It would be reverted. It would be come back to his, to his heirs. A different set of laws applied if there was the sale of a house in a wall city. It could be redeemed up to one full year after the sale. Not true if someone sold a house in an unwalled town or village. In that case, the house would be considered the same as a field. It would revert back to the original seller in the year of Jubilee, or it could be redeemed any time before. And the, the rules of proration for the value would apply. And again, there were uh, special provisions for the Levites. If a Levite sold one of their houses inside one of their cities, it could be redeemed at any time up to the, Ju the year of Jubilee, and in the year of Jubilee, if it had not been re redeemed, that house would go back to the Levite. So that was their inheritance, and, it would, and they would keep that. So a different set of rules. And for the land that surrounded the Levite cities, keep in mind, all the tribes had to donate a certain number of their towns and cities to the Levites. They were scattered throughout Israel, according to the, the blessing or prophecy made by Jacob. The land around the cities was common, and it could not be sold. Lending to the poor was the next provision. If one of your brothers becomes poor and falls into poverty among you, then you shall help him like a stranger or a sojourner that he may live with you. Take no usury or, in, or interest from him, but fear your Lord that your brother may live with you. And he followed up with, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. Next, we have the law concerning slavery. And there was one law for the native Israelites and another law for the alien residents. A person, a, a native Israelite could sell himself to another Israelite to, for, because he needed money, because he had to pay off a debt, whatever. But he was not to be treated as a slave. He was to be treated as a hired servant. And the language was he should not be ruled over with rigor. So it was like a term of employment that was going to last until the year of Jubilee. This man could be redeemed by any of the male relatives in his family any time before the year of Jubilee. 
And if he had not, or he could redeem himself if he was able to come into some money. But in the year of Jubilee, he returned to his own family with any children that he had during the time that he was uh, an, uh, a bond servant. Now, a different law applied to non-Israelite slaves. They were free to purchase uh, slaves from the remnant of the nations that lived round about them or anyone coming in. They could buy, they could buy people who were non-Israelite and they were permanent possessions. They could even be treated in, uh, passed on in an inheritance. No provision to release those servants, those slaves in the year of Jubilee. Another provision, if an Israelite became poor and sold himself to a non-Israelite. Well, a similar situation existed as if he had sold himself to a, an Israelite man. He was not to be treated harshly. He was not to serve with rigor. He was to be treated as a hired man. And he could be redeemed by any male relative, and the price of his, his redemption would be prorated based on how many years it would be until the next year of Jubilee. If he had not been released in the year of Jubilee, he would go free. He would return back to his home. And he followed up these instructions. God said, for the children are, of Israel are servants to me. They are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Israel. I am the Lord. Okay, chapter 26, blessings for obedience, punishment for disobedience. First of all, in the first two verses of this chapter, there are admonishments, warning about falling into idolatry, admonishments in the form of encouraging them to keep the Sabbaths. And when they, and I interpret this in using Sabbaths in a plural sense as not just every seventh day, but the days in which, during the feast, which there would be no work on, on those feasts where there would be no work on the first and the eighth day. Uh, any time that there was to be no work, and then to encouragement to rever this sanctuary. So here we're talking about the tabernacle with all of its observances, all the feasts. So you rever if you rever this, the tabernacle, then you are going to be keeping all the feasts, and you remain faithful to God. And there was a very nice list of blessings for obedience. And the blessings could be easily classified as physical blessings and spiritual blessings. The physical blessings would be he would give them rain in its season and there would be no famine. The, the land would produce abundantly. He would give them peace and safety in the land. He would rid the land of wild beasts or evil beasts. They would not be successfully invaded. God said he would, he would chase their enemies and they will fall by the sword before them. And God said he would look favorably on them and make them multiply. The spiritual blessings included he will confirm his covenant with them. He will set his tabernacle among them. He will not abhor them. He will walk among them and be their God. They will be his people. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you to walk upright. And in all of these spiritual blessings that they were going to enjoy, we can see as in the new covenant people who respond to the gospel we enjoy the same blessings either in, if not in this life in the resurrection we will enjoy all of these these blessings the punishments for disobedience was even more lengthy and it's like uh, a, a miniature version of the blessings and curses that we're going to study about 
later on when we get to the book of Deuteronomy. But a uh, terrible list. Uh, they, he would bring on them terror and diseases, defeat from their enemies. Those who hate them will reign over them. They would have famines. Punishments will be seven times greater than their sins, seven times more plagues according to their sins. The wild beasts will multiply and destroy their children and their herds and make them few in number. They will be driven to cannibalism because of the siege by their, of their cities by their enemies. Their cities will be laid waste and their sanctuaries brought to desolation. Their enemies will dwell in their land. They will be scattered among the nations. The land will enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate and you are in your enemies' lands. And for those who are left, that remnant that stays in the land, they will suffer faintness of heart, fear, no power to stand before their enemies, and they will waste away for their iniquity. Now, if you look back, or if when we get to the book of Joshua, Joshua through Second Chronicles, we are going to see every one of these promises fulfilled one way or another. Did all these things happen? Yes, it absolutely did. But there was also the promise of rest, restoration for those who repented and humbled themselves to God and confessed their, sin, their sins and the sins of their fathers. Chapter 27, Redeeming Persons and Property Dedicated to the Lord. This is one where I have read it in the past and I, my eyes would glaze over it. In preparing for this class, I had to read it and reread it and try to uh, make clear sense of it. Vows consecrating certain persons to the Lord came with a provision to redeem them back through the payment of money. So, the, de the people were divided into male and female and by age groups. So, age one month to four year, through four years of age, a male was valued at five shekels, a female valued at three shekels. Ages five through 19, a male was valued at 20 shekels, and a female was valued, valued at 10 shekels. Ages 20 through 59, a man was valued at 50 shekels, and a woman was valued at 30 shekels. Ages 60 and over, a man was valued at 15 shekels, and a woman valued at 10 shekels. So, redeeming these people that were had been consecrated for performing work. It wasn't, if they were Levite, yeah, they could participate in the tabernacle service. If they were not, which the majority would not, they would have been dedicated to other types of work outside the tabernacle, uh, supporting uh, that worship, but only in an indirect way. But these were, this was the value if they were to be redeemed back and released from that service. That was the value that, they, that was to be paid. If someone brought a clean animal as an offering to the Lord, he changed his mind, he wanted to exchange it for another animal, that animal had to be of equal value and equal suitability. If an unclean animal had been given for uh, the service or had been uh, consecrated to the, uh, the, temple, the tabernacle service, it could be redeemed for the value of the animal plus 20%. Houses that had been dedicated to, uh, to be holy to the Lord, they could be redeemed for the value of the house plus 20%. Dedication of fields to the Lord. The value was based on the land's productive ability. One homer of barley of seed equals 50 shekels. So that was how they were 
to begin the calculation. Okay, we are out of time. Thank you for your attention, and I'm glad we got through. Well, we liked about a half chapter being finished. So thank you very much.